you all to know that I'm very pleased to say that I am Mary Parker because I was married May 28th this year and uh, this needs to be higher somebody who knows how to fix stop the tape <laughs> well I got that title basically um, from this book you might know Charles Trombley who wrote Kicked Out of the Kingdom, and uh, I really enjoyed this book a lot. And I just wanted you to know, because you probably all um, caught where the title came from. Some of you did, probably. And so I just wanted to change one word, Kicked Out of Their Kingdom, not God's. Uh, I want to um, quickly go through probably the steps of, that led me up to going in to the Watchtower Society and then the 10 years being there, I studied a year, 10 years in, and then 10 years coming out or out of the society. When I went into Jehovah's Witnesses, it wasn't really direct. Um, my brother had skipped school one day, and the Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door and gave him the blue book, the truth book. And he had that for a while, and he gave it to me one day, and I read it, and I thought, oh, this is terrific. You get answers to everything. I mean, there's no hell. This is terrific. I showed my mother. I said, Ma, this is great. She said, I'll put that thing away. That's garbage. That's all she ever said. And I really felt that she didn't know what she was saying. She didn't take the time to look into it and, and, and answer me. Um, I was, I was um, searching then to find answers because it was a troubled time. We're talking around 1970-71, and from there, from uh, reading this book, I went on to studying a couple of times with the witnesses, and I found them to be very boring and uninteresting. So I left, I left Massachusetts, got a job in New Hampshire, and I ended up having a boss that was a Jehovah's Witness. He started me up with another study with his daughter, who was too young and brought along, probably it was a pioneer, I don't know. And I studied a couple of times with them and said, I have to get away from these people. They really don't know what they're saying. They, they, can't, they, they can't seem to talk logically to me. And they're not answering my questions. I should have really listened to myself and stayed away and never in, invited them in my house again. But my sister at this time now ended up coming into the Jehovah's Witnesses, my older sister, through my brother who had studied but never became one. And she sent someone to my door. I'm back in Massachusetts again, a job change. And this is uh, the year 1973, no, 72, around the beginning, uh, maybe middle. I'm not too sure of the time period then. Anyways, I studied with her and we clicked. Her personality was bouncy. It was, uh, she was um, rather dynamic and, and exciting to be with. Uh, she wasn't. She wasn't boring. And so it was her personality, really, that pulled me in. And she gave me answers that I wanted to know. She didn't just drop subjects if, if I was delving into them too much. She answered things that I wanted to know. So from there, I studied um, and got baptized about, I think I should take my notes out. <laughs> I got baptized in 1974. And there was a lot of turmoil, as I said, in that time period. And I remember that um, my daughter would probably um, never have a rocking horse because the Jehovah's Witnesses talked about the end coming. And I wouldn't buy a rocking horse for her because she wouldn't need it. We were going to be in the new system. And I remember the long gas lines. I'm sure you all have. And, uh, boy, that was it. The gas lines were proof. Uh, boy, uh, we, that's what we talk about at the Kingdom Hall all the time. The gas line, that's proof. We're running out of gas. We're not going to make it. <laughs> I was sold 100% on the society. It, you know, I was out there with my baby on my back and those carry things that they have for babies in the middle of the winter in snowstorms knocking on doors. I actually looked down at some of the Jehovah's Witnesses because they've been in for years and they weren't doing what I was doing. 
I mean, I, I was really diligent to get this work done. We had a short time. But I didn't know they were in for a long time, and they had gotten tired, and they have heard. <laughs> they got tired of it. <laughs> so I was going to learn, though. So I spent, uh, you know, I was pretty pleased with being a witness. Um, I felt like we had the assembly. So the world had Christmas and birthdays. So what? We had the assemblies. We got dressed up at that time. We made clothes. I don't know about you, but in our family, everybody made clothes. And um, a lot of the witnesses I knew in the Kingdom Hall, they all made their clothes. And we looked snappy for the assemblies. And it was a great time. We got to be at a hotel, use a pool. And if you were like most Jehovah's Witnesses, they, you know, they weren't the upper class. They weren't well-to-do. And uh, we thought that was a great time to get away and go to a hotel, especially when we went to Canada. Uh, it was the International Assembly. That was terrific. We went out of the country. You know, how many people go out of the country? And this is what I would tell my daughter. Do you know how privileged you are to stay in a hotel in another country? You don't need Christmas. What do you need Christmas for? <laughs> so she would think, oh, wow, wow, other people don't do this. That's how I made up for her. So, but I, I must say I was very fortunate in one way to have a husband that was not a Jehovah's Witness. And he provided my daughter with birthdays and Christmas and things like that. Mm -hmm. Even though I would um, step back from it and say, no, no, you can't do that. I was kind of inside. I was a little bit happy she got something. You know, you just, you just have that. You just, if you... If you were ever out of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, weren't born in it, came in it, you knew what Christmas was like, you knew what birthdays were like, they were happy times. They weren't as miserable, dreary times as they lead you to believe. So about this time now, I'm, I've done a lot of work in, in, with the Witnesses, and um, I'm now expanding. I want to do other things, and uh, I want to meet other people. And, and I did this through herbs. I started selling herbs. And it brought me to another congregation. I should say it brought me to another town where I met other people from another congregation. And one of them was an elder and his wife, and I got really close with them. And uh, we got to, to um, do a lot of talking, and uh, she would discuss things with me like there was problems in the Kingdom Hall, and uh, a lot of the problems were being solved with disfellowshipping them. And I said, well, what in the world would he disallowish them over if it wasn't, you know, immoral stuff? What else is there? And uh, she said, oh, Mary. I said, well, drinking or immoral? What else is there? She said, well, two women got disfellowshipped because of grace. I said, grace who? <laughs> she said, grace, you know, grace. I said, well, what's grace? She said, grace, it's, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, Gee, it's, well, it's forgiveness or something. It's, it's like, I don't really know, she'd say. And I said, wow, that's weird, getting disfellowshipped on grace. So she, these people were writing letters to everyone, telling them about grace. And I said, well, can you get me one? You know? I don't know. How in the world can you get disfellowshipped on grace? So <laughs> she, she got me one, and I still didn't really understand it. It, you know, it just it didn't make sense to me. So in the meantime, I'm starting to have kind of funny feelings about the organization. Didn't didn't really express them. I just started to feel unhappy out in service. When I would temporary pioneer, I would notice that the elders, wives, and the pioneers would team up and go into the doors. Now here I am with an unbelieving husband. And I had girlfriends that had unbelieving husbands. So when we're going out, we say, you know, these people always team up. Why aren't they with us, helping us? We need the help. So I'm a troublemaker, see? I'm saying the elder's wives should be with us, or the pioneers should be with us, and they should be training. You know, let's get the training program going here. I mean, what are you doing? So I express myself to other brothers and uh, sisters, mostly sisters. Well, I didn't know it, but I was cutting my own throat. Because one of the elders, Chris, um, who I sort of picked on his wife, Mary Lou, <laughs> he had it in for me, and I didn't know that at the time that he had it in for me. And he started going around to 
people I basically hung around with, um, single sisters and um, um, sisters that didn't have husbands in the organization. And he went around to them and asked them, has Mary ever said anything to you that was untheocratic? Has she ever said anything that was gossipy-like? And uh, eventually it got back to me, and I remember sitting uh, with a friend, and, she, and I said, something's going on. Did, do you know what's wrong with Chris? And she said, um, no. And I said, has Chris talked to you? And she said, no. And I said, something's wrong. Diane, talk to me, please. She said, I can't talk to you. I said, oh my gosh, what do you mean you can't talk to me? What's going on? I said, if I name people, will you shake your head yes or no? I said, is Chris after me? She'd go, no. And, no, shake her head. No, <laughs> get, it, get it right. <laughs> and then I say, how about Bobby, another elder? She'd go, mm-hmm. And I'd say, what about Richard? Mm-hmm. I said, what is going on? What is going on? Can't tell you. Can't tell you. And I was getting so nervous. I said, they're doing something to me. What are they doing to me? I can't tell you, but it's, it's bad. It's really bad. I said, oh, my God. And I am a wreck. I mean, I am really shaking in my boots because I feel like I've done nothing wrong. And I love the organization. I love Jehovah. I just, you know, and this is big stuff, you know. All that, you all know that. So, anyways, they had a committee meeting for me. And they, um, in the committee meeting, Chris was sitting behind me, who was the elder that drummed up this trouble. And then we had the uh, other three. We had Lee and, and Bobby and Richie, who were brothers, blood brothers, um, who were in the uh, committee meeting. And so they questioned me and questioned me about everything. And what happened was they brought out all their witnesses in, but all the witnesses didn't have really anything to say. So it all turned on Chris, who was behind me. And they, what they did is they put me on probation anyways, you know, just to kind of teach me a lesson. Just don't do anything in case you ever thought of it, you know. <laughs> so, tell you thing, and, and then I find out through Bobby, who's the youngest elder, who's come into the, being an elder, he told me secretly we have to, um, you know, speak to Chris because he wasn't doing things right. But I want you to know, Mary, you just put on probation here. Just, it's just for temporary, you know. So I was on um, probation, and I felt so sick. That was the turmoil that really started it. That th- this thing about probation, it, ju- it just, it's crazy. Um, I felt like they were watching me all the time. Big brother is watching you. What, are you, what was I going to do wrong? Was I going to sit wrong? Was I going to walk wrong? I, I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody. They, they were watching me. Then finally they called a meeting, and I was taken off probation. I felt like I wasn't watched anymore. And then it was all seemed rather ridiculous. But that wasn't the end of it. I started feeling very uncomfortable being, um, having this happen to me. So I started to feel very lonely. I, uh, and um, I started wondering why this woman who I would travel back and forth to Lemonster for the herbs, why she was so nice. Why was she so kind? I was the Jehovah's Witness. Why was she so nice? I should be nice. I should be happy. How come she's happy? And matter of fact, how come my sister, Kathy, and John, who are born-again Christians in North Carolina, are happy? And why have they got it together? How come I don't have it together? It just really rubbed me wrong. <laughs> I, just, I just felt like it isn't fair. And I would tell Jehovah, I said, it's not fair. You should at least make me look good. You know? <laughs> And so I started, I started praying to God. I said, Jehovah, Jehovah, you know that I know this is your organization. You know that I believe it 100%. Without a doubt, this is it. This is the only place on earth. I love it. I love being here. This is it. But if, for any chance, because the Bible does say that th- there's a scripture in there that says that Satan can blind you. You know, he can, you, you can have like blinders on. So I said, God, Jehovah, please get me out of here if it's not the right place. Oh. <laughs> but I said, the tack on the, at the end, I said, but don't forget, I believe it is. <laughs> so, so I remember 
Um, one trip that I was taking back from Lemonster, it's a 40 minute ride from Lemonster to Lowell. Judy was driving, I had to go in the, in the back of the truck. She, she has the truck cover over it. And I was sitting there in the back, she's got a lot of hay in the, in the back of it, and I was sitting there with my daughter. And it, she's, uh, I think she's about nine or 10. And um, I started to sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, all the Bible tells me so. Little ones and you be, and I'm singing this, and she's going, Ma, what are you singing? <laughs> I said, Why? What's the matter with it? She goes, I've never heard that at the Kingdom Hall before. <laughs> I said, Well, I didn't learn it there. <laughs> I said, I used to sing that when I was a little kid. I used to go to church, Baptist church. I used to sing that, and I said, What do you think? Doesn't it sound kind of cute? And she goes, I don't know. I said, You want to know another one? <laughs> and I said, I don't really remember too many, but B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God of the B-I-B-L-E. Oh, my God. I said, isn't that great? And she goes, oh, wow, that's weird. <laughs> and I said, well, I think they're kind of cute. So the Lord started working in my life. He started changing me. And I remember at work, I was put on this job where I didn't have to do much, um, and I used to read the watch on the awake all the time. I was trying to get back into it. I'm going to get strong again. I'm going to be right out there. And it was depressing me. It was, oh, it was terrible. They were depressing me so much, the magazines. I'm saying, isn't there anything in these magazines, anything that's good? I mean, really good, good stuff, happy stuff. And I started looking for happy stuff. And it, <laughs> I started, I think there's nothing really in here that's really good. You know, like when you come out, you hear all these testimonies, these wonderful testimonies. They didn't have anything like that. <laughs> Not good. So I, I really started feeling bad um, about all the literature that they put out. I started to feel like I really wanted to know more. So I called Elisa up. Remember the elder's wife? I said, Elisa, um, do you have any more things? <laughs> she said, yeah, I have books. I said, bring them over. So she came over with a bunch of books. And we went through the books. And, and I really didn't understand uh, when she said that 1914, was not, that date was wrong. I said, I don't understand. I don't understand why they got it anyway. So I don't understand why it's wrong. So I couldn't have, I said, well, at least it really doesn't matter to me. I don't care about 1914. What other things? And she went, she brought a whole bunch of stuff out. And my sister, who lived underneath me, I was in a two family. My sister, who was a witness, lived underneath me. And she was coming up the stairs. I said, oh, my God. And we shoved everything underneath um, anything on the table. And we just acted like nothing was happening. She came in. And we were scared half to death. Because, you know, you can't let anybody know you're reading all this apostate literature. So she left because we ignored her. Went back downstairs. <laughs> and, and, and we got into it again. And I said, well, just could you just leave the books with me so I can read them over? So she left a few of them with me. And I looked them over and stuff. But uh, eventually, all these doubts, I had to get cleared up because I was going to stay in the organization. So I called an elder, David. And um, he told me that he would meet with me and talk over all these doubts that I had. In the meantime, I told my sister downstairs that I had read all this literature, but don't worry about it. I got an appointment with the elder. We're all we're going to clear it all up. And he said he would go over everything with me, and everything was going to be fine. Well, she told someone at work who was a witness. And the witness immediately ran over to the elders and told them that Mary had been reading apostate literature. And they, uh, I heard about it that she had told them, and I knew that she went to the elders. And I said, how could you do this to me? I said, I told you I had an appointment with one of the elders. And now, and, and this was an elder that was rather loving and understanding. And um, the brother had gone to, the brother that my sister had told had gone to the other elders that had been on a committee meeting with me before. So I was in trouble. And uh, I flew off to New York to talk to my best girlfriend, Marguerite, who was in Buffalo. And we were like this. She had to move away. And uh, I just had to talk to her. So I flew out to talk to her. It was around Christmas time in 1983. Talked to her. I was scared to death. I said, what's going to happen to me? What are they going to do? Blah, 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 blah. She had, gone, she had been involved with a lot of disfellowshipping out in her congregation in Buffalo. And she was trying to, like, 
cheer me up and say, don't worry, just say this, say this, da, 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 da. She would give me all this stuff to say. And I just went home and I thought, well, maybe be all right. I arrived on a night, I arrived home on a night that there was a meeting and a witness lived next door to me. Now, my sister underneath me was a witness and next door a witness. And he comes and knocks at my door at 10 o'clock at night and I'm sleeping and my mother, my husband's still up watching TV. And he saw saying, who in the world is at the door? And I said, I don't know, why don't you answer it? So he answered it, and it was the witness next door. He came up and he gave me a piece of paper that was torn, and it was written in pencil, an appointment for a committee meeting for me, in pencil, and it was printed. You know, that is strange. I found out later that they were told to do things in pencil, you know, and so the, and not make it look too good because people were, I guess there was witnesses taking them to court on things like committee meetings and stuff like that and accusing them of lying. So they were now putting things on in pencil so you couldn't really verify and they wouldn't sign it. So I had a committee meeting and uh, at that committee meeting I had really, I had lost it because uh, I was pretty upset. Um, I couldn't believe it was happening. Uh, and they had disfellowshipped me on apostasy, lying, and gossip. And I appealed it. And when I appealed it, you know that upsets them. <laughs> it really upsets them. They have to call in elders from other towns. So they, they called in these elders. Um, one was Drake, one was Lawrence, and I forget where the other one was. But uh, so here I am with three more. And uh, they brought all the witnesses. I guess they were a little nervous now. They brought all these witnesses in against me. And uh, basically, they had kept with the, same, the first decision, which was um, apostasy and gossip. And they threw out lying. They could find no grounds for lying. And I was glad they threw that out. Um, <laughs> it, just, it just made me feel better as a person, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I was never a liar. <laughs> but during the course of the, of the meeting, um, when my sister was in there testifying against me, I had, um, I had completely fell apart and ran to the ladies' room, and uh, I locked myself in the bathroom. And people came in and were knocking on the door, and I was somehow I was blacking out. All the voices, all the noise of the knocking on the door were just going off in the distance. I couldn't hear anything anymore. It was the strangest feeling. It was like I was going into a coma, staring straight ahead, going into a coma. Something was happening to me. It was just like I couldn't hear them. They said they were yelling and screaming at me. I couldn't hear them. Well, they told me that my husband had, because my husband had come, because he didn't know what was going to happen to me, because I, I was so serious about this religion. He didn't know what was going to happen to me if I'd flip out or not. But he came, and he got into the, the stall, the bathroom stall. He went underneath unlocked, they told me, and he just walloped me right across the face and just shook me right out of it. And I just came out like, what happened? And after that, I was crying excessively and splashing water and everything on me. And, and it just, it was such a shock that they would disfellowship me. Um, I, I must say that I, um, that happened at the appeal. But before they would give me the answer, um, let me back up a little bit, before they gave me the answer for that, they wanted me alone because of what had happened in the bathroom and, and I almost blacked out. So they had set a time for me to come back um, in two days. So I came back in two days and then they told me, and there was a severe snowstorm at that time. They closed down Logan Airport. And so I came back alone and uh, I, because um, my husband hadn't been coming home from work, he was stuck on the highway. And Marguerite, uh, she felt like everything was going to be okay, that they, they would not give a negative answer. They would, they would keep me as a witness, but just reprove me. So she said, Mary, it'll be okay. You just go alone. You'll be all right. And, and they called the meeting. I mean, they shut down Logan Airport, but the elders could make the meeting for me. And so they, they informed me that um, I was disfellowshipped and that um, Jehovah was reproving me and that he, he needed to discipline me severely so that I would understand not to read this apostate literature anymore. 
And uh, they asked me to please leave the room because they were going to pray, and they could not pray anymore around a disfellowshipped person. And my heart sank. I all of a sudden felt very dirty, like I was no good, like Jehovah had really thrown me away. But the thing is that as I was waiting for them to all gather, I had read the scripture that I felt like God showed me, which is in Job 24, where he talks about all the bad things that have happened to people. Um, the widows were forgotten, and um, a lot of terrible things that were going on. If you have a chance, read all Job 24. And I really felt that God showed me that, so that when I went in to hear this news that I was disfellowshipped, I could take it for just a little while, <laughs> because Jehovah was going to make it right. He was going to make it right somehow, because Jehovah knew I was suffering, and he was going to make it right, because he saw all the suffering of the, um, the widows, the orphans, and whatever. So I left there, and as soon as I got in my car, I just headed for a liquor store. And I wasn't <laughs> taking it too well. <laughs> <laughs> so, I really didn't want to drink, but I just parked in front of the liquor store, went in and got a big, big bottle of coffee brandy. Then I went over to Wendy's and got some milk, and then I went over to um, a supermarket, and it was snowing. It was a severe snowstorm going on. And I sat and poured the two of them together, and I just kept drinking and drinking and drinking. And I said, now it's hitting me. And I'm going, fine, if they don't want me, if Jehovah don't want me, well, then I'll just go kill myself. <laughs> so I went where I saw a cemetery, and I parked in front of it, and I said, this is where I'm going to end up. I said, so I'm just going to drive around and get real drunk so that I can get out of my car, walk over there, stand in front of somebody's um, tombstone, and just lay out and freeze to death. <laughs> So I had to get real drunk to do this, though. So I kept driving and drinking and driving. And in the meantime, I'm getting really, really drunk. And so I decided I'm going to stop and tell everybody I forgive them. So I stopped and called up my sister, said, I forgive you. I said, would you tell my mother, by the way, our mother, that um, I love her and uh, I, I never have told her that. And I really love her and I, I'm afraid she's going to die of cancer before I tell her, so you tell her. And uh, then I said some other things. I don't know where this stuff came from. I said, I, I forgive the elders. I actually forgive the elders for what they did to me. And I just let it all go. I was so drunk, I didn't care what was happening. I didn't care. And um, I kept drinking. Then I got to another phone booth. I was going from phone booth to phone booth. And I called New York. <laughs> called New York and told um, Marguerite's husband, call Lowell, where I live, call Lowell and tell them that I got this fellowship and I'm just riding around. And uh, I didn't tell them I was drinking, though. So then I, then I kept going, and I got to another phone booth, and now I'm really drunk. <laughs> and my husband got the phone, and he picked up, and he said, where are you? I said, never mind where I am. And he says, where are you? Screaming it at me. And I said, shut up, and slammed the phone down. <laughs> so I don't know what did it. I just decided to drive home because he was so mad. <laughs> <laughs> So I drove home. I drove home, and uh, I I couldn't get out of the car. And I and I yelled out to Scott, who was my sister's husband, "Would you go upstairs and get my husband and have him come down?" So he came down, and I said, "Let's go skiing. Let's go sledding." So he said, "Push over." And I said, "No." So he got on the other side. I drove him around the block. I almost crashed up. Crashed the car came back, drove right in, just one block around and parked again. He got around, opened the door, and I fell out cold. I was out. That was it. Well, they dragged my body all the way up the, the sidewalk and then up the stairs and threw me in the bathroom where I threw up all night long. And I heard little bits of my girlfriend crying. I couldn't hardly remember anything. And she had cried all night. And uh, I guess she went to the airport with uh, my husband. She had to go home that next day. I had paid for her to fly out to save my life and paid for her to fly back, but it didn't work. 
And so here I was the next day. Um, I was terrible. I didn't know it, but my mother had received a phone call from my sister who now felt guilty. <laughs> and she called my mother and said, you better go check up on Mary. Something's wrong with her. She knew I was to sell a ship, and she knew I was, you know, uh, I had gotten drunk the night before. So she, she called her and said, you better go see. I don't know what's wrong with you. You better go see. Well, she came in the house, and she said, what's the matter with you? I said, I don't know. I'm sick. I'm sick. She said, what's the matter with you? And I said, I'm to sell a ship. She said, praise the Lord. I, so I, I couldn't believe it. She's got to say, praise the Lord, when I'm depressed and ready to kill myself. I said, she doesn't understand. So, so I go, so I go uh, through this period of really crying. Um, could hardly work at work. Um, they wanted to give me some counseling at work because they, they found out from other workers what had happened. And so uh, I had seen a counselor once, and I felt like she needed help, not me. So I, went, I, I just couldn't believe it. So I, I, I did it. <laughs> So after that, I just, it was so, I was so sick, I mean, just sick, crying for hours, that my mother paid for the flight down to North Carolina and to see my sister Kathy and her husband John to see if they could help me and um, then fly back. Uh, they would pay to fly back. Um, so I went down there. I thought, what are they going to do to me there? Morning and Kristen, what are they going to do to me? And I was so scared to go there, but they just, it's like the Lord had talked to them. My brother-in-law told me, just leave her alone, just leave her alone. So I went through their house looking at magazines and books and, and listening to tapes, and I was hearing all this Christian stuff. They didn't say one word to me, and I was going to them saying, did you hear this? Did you read this? This is all their stuff. This is all Christian stuff. I can't believe this. This is real. This is real. And I accepted the Lord. I accepted the Lord through that. And I just, you know, I can't remember the hour, the minute, the time, but I accepted him and my whole life changed. I started seeing things. I would look at people. Uh, you know, you know how you're just shopping or you're just in a car and looking at the drivers. I would look at them and say, I don't have to judge you. I don't have to judge you. And and you're not so bad. I don't know if you're going to be dead or you're going to be alive. I don't know anything about you. Because I used to go around saying, wolf, sheep, wolf, sheep, wolf. <laughs> I mean, that's how you get. And it was so relaxing. I said, this is terrific. These are real people. It was just this weight lifted off of me that I didn't have to do this work. <laughs> so, let's catch up here. So I would say that, um, uh, let's see, that trip to North Carolina really helped me a lot. It, it just, it, it changed me a lot. But uh, I still was depressed. Uh, I still, you know, you go in and out of it. And there was one time that I was driving home from my mother's house, and I just, I felt like I couldn't take it anymore. It, it's too much. It's just too much. Because you feel still, like the brother said, you still feel like you've been brainwashed to believe the way the watchtower has taught you. So you, your mind keeps going back to that thinking. So you, you really don't know if what you're listening to now is the truth. So I prayed to God. I, said, I was driving home, and I said, God, please help me go right into this tree right now. Okay, I want to drive. And I stepped on the accelerator, and I kept driving into the street, and I'm picking up speed. I'm saying, God, please help me. Please help me. I want to come home. I want to come home, and I'm crying and crying, and I'm driving tr straight toward this tree. And I'm going faster and faster, and then all of a sudden, a picture of my daughter comes in, and I didn't drive into the tree. I thank God, because it just, it's just a, such a depressing feeling um, that overtakes you in a moment. You don't even know it's coming. And then you just, nothing is real anymore, and you want to die. You just want to die and not have to think about it anymore. Um, through that, I realized that I was addicted to misery. Through that... <laughs> And I was in a bookstore one day, and I saw that title, Addicted to Misery. And I said, wow, what an interesting book. I picked it up, I looked at it, put it down, and it wouldn't leave me. The thought of that book wouldn't leave me. So I got that. I just want to tell anybody who, you know, 
addicted to misery. That is us. You know, we were addicted to misery. That's all they ever taught us was misery, told us about misery. We stayed with misery, and we, we even married people that were miserable. <laughs> search coming out, I ended up marrying somebody who just said they were a Christian. And actually, I was marrying another miserable person because I had gotten divorced. My husband had left me. And I got divorced and uh, married again. And um, I did not know what I was stepping into. I just thought, oh, God's given me a Christian. Oh, this is wonderful. And it felt so good. I, I had a Christian. But he wasn't. And it lasted three years. And he walked out of my life August 2nd. 1992 and when he walked out um, he just it just ripped my heart out of me totally ripped my heart out of me and I spent I thought I was miserable as a witness being kicked out of there but this felt like it was worse but what it was was is a combination of being kicked out of Jehovah's Witnesses and being um, left in two marriages and it was the the feeling of rejection was so overwhelming now, I just couldn't stand it. I would uh, literally bang on walls and uh, to try to save my sanity, I would write scriptures on huge pieces of paper and put them on the walls everywhere because in case I woke up, and I, I'd have to read them to know that I was still sane. <laughs> so, no. And through that, through that year, I, I was about six months I couldn't work. And uh, I'd go to work and have to run home. And then uh, I lost my house. It was foreclosed on. And uh, I went bankrupt. And I was just, at, I just couldn't take it no more. And my sister called me one day when I was taking pills to take my life. And she said, Mary, I just had to call you. And I, and I was crying. I had been crying all that day. And she said, the strangest thing happened to me. I had a dream. And uh, I dreamt you had taken your life. And John doesn't want me to tell you this dream because he thinks it's stupid that I should tell you this because it's just a dream. But I want to tell you anyways. So she told me I had a dream that you had killed yourself and that you were an angel and that you were praising God. And uh, that that you knew that God had things that were better for you, that he, he had a life for you, and you were, he still wanted to do, you to do more things, but you ended your life too soon, and uh, he took you, and he didn't reject you. And that's all she had to say to me, because I couldn't take my life after that. I just couldn't do it. I, I, I thought, he loves me that much? Did he give my sister a dream? And to call me on the same moment I was taking these pills? I said, he really does love me. And, and I couldn't help it. So I, I went down to see my sister again in North Carolina, and we spent some time together there. She came up. She spent an, uh, a month with me. And we were getting ready for me to move down there. She, we had a big yard sale and everything. And, and uh, she went back down. I went with her, and I came back up. And I felt like I was strong enough to handle everything. But the people at work were calling me to uh, always saying, you got to go out. you got to just get back in the swing of things. Just go out. So I said to them, I'm ready. I'm going to go out to a dance, one dance, just to, just to breathe. <laughs> so I went to this dance at the Sheraton. It's a together dance for singles. And I went there. It's a lot of older people and, you know, singles, that, divorcees and stuff like that. And it was my first time there. And I said, I'll never go here again. I'm going to get out of here. So I stayed in the corner eating the crackers and cheese and I didn't know it but my future husband was eyeing me from across the room and uh, I never thought the Lord would do this and uh, he came into my life <laughs> and he asked me to dance and we danced the whole night and the girl I was with she found someone they danced the whole night and uh, there was a song that was sung while I was dancing to him and I started crying for my husband my ex-husband who had left me and uh, I told him, I said, I'm sorry, but I, I, I still feel for my husband, my ex-husband. 
And he was so touched by that that he, because he was in a 22-year marriage that was dead. It was dead eight years ago, but he couldn't face it. And the same thing happened to him. People at his place of work were encouraging to, to go that night. So here we have two people, two different places of employment, and they're both encouraging us to go that night, our first night, and we meet. First dance, the two. And uh, so from then, he wanted to see me. And uh, he wanted to see me the very next day, um, called me up, and uh, he said, how about if, you know, we go out maybe, it was Saturday morning, he said, how about if we go out maybe Saturday or, uh, I mean, Sunday or whatever, and he said, I said, okay, and he said, how about tonight? I said, wow, all right. So we went out that night, we had dinner, and he wanted to see me again, I said, what am I doing? I'm getting involved again, so I'm not going to do this. And he said, could I see you again? And I said, well, yeah, church tomorrow. He said, well, where is it? And I told him, and I didn't expect him to go to church. Uh, but he did. He showed up at church, and then he wanted to see me again. So I said, well, we have a group meeting. I said, you can go Wednesday. So he showed up Wednesday. So I kept showing up every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Sunday, every Wednesday. So I said, oh, it seems like a nice guy. He was crying over the songs. <laughs> he was saying, where has this been all my life? I can't believe it. I grew up a Lutheran. I've been in the Lutheran church. And I hadn't gone back for like 25 years, he said. But I grew up in it. I was, I was you know, strong in it. And he said, we never, they never said anything like this. They never did this stuff. And so he, I brought him here. So this was going to be the test. Because I brought my ex-husband here, and he hated this place. He hated it. So I said, I'll bring him here. So I came here last year with him. And he got up on stage. He, he came up and they had an altar call. And... <laughs> He said, the, something happened to me right from the top of my head to the bottom of my head. Something happened to me, Mary. He said, this is great. This place is great. And he's crying and everything. I said, oh, I don't know. This could be a trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a fight with him. <laughs> Poor guy's accepting the Lord and everything, and I'm having a fight with him. <laughs> So it, it turned out that he really has loved the Lord and everything. We got married in May, like I said, and we went off honeymoon. But I wanted to, I wanted to, before I forget this uh, scripture here, and it, it really means a lot to me. Um, the Lord had shown me um, John, second, uh, John 2, 16. Um, let me read that to you. This is when, one time when I was just reading my Bible and Everything was rather confusing to me. Let me start in 16, where Jesus was in the temple now. And he's saying um, to the Pharisees, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a, fo a house of merchandise. Now go down to 18. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us, seeing that you do do these things. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews therefore said, it took 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Can anyone tell me what words were really important there? Can anyone tell me? What God was showing me? Say it. I will raise it up. How can Jesus raise himself up? How can he? And I'm saying, wait a minute. Is this in the Jehovah's Witness Bible? So I ran to the Bible. It's in there. It's in there. I said, oh my gosh. I literally went around breathing heavy. No. Who? I don't believe it. It's right there. It's right there. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh my gosh. God was showing me. He was taking the blinders off my eyes. God was going to raise up his, Jesus was going to raise up his own body. Only God could raise him up. Was he God? Yes. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I tell you. And the funny part is that, you know, years later, on Walter Martin, uh, on that radio show, 
He said he talked to a woman, the same script that the Lord revealed to her. God is doing a lot of people the same way. <laughs> he is really neat. Another scripture. Another scripture here. Um, let's go to Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. This is, this is a great one. This is a great one. Let me tell you, because I was visiting my brother one time, the brother that started the whole thing when he took a book at the door. He had gotten so cold. He didn't even get baptized. He had a nerve. He didn't even get baptized. And he just felt like I was the dirtiest person in the world to be coming to him and telling him that he should come out of the witnesses because um, it's wrong. All these things were wrong. Well, I left there, his house, and I fell apart crying on the road. I mean, I just broke down. He was so cold. He was so vicious. The way he was talking to me like venom coming out of his mouth. It was so disgusting. I was shaking and crying all the way home. And the Lord reminded me of a scripture. It said, and he, let me start at um, Luke, 19, Luke 19.39. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. The Lord impressed upon me. I'm saying this is for me. He impressed upon me that my heart was stone, just like my brother's, and that he had softened my heart. And that's why I was feeling again. I had feeling. I was so stony cold. Let's go to Ezekiel. You probably all know what this is. Ezekiel 11, 19. Um, oh, let me get to it. I folded this so I'd find it quickly. Okay. Ezekiel 11, 19. And I shall give them one heart, and shall put a new spirit within them. And I shall take the heart of stone out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. He really changed my heart. I can't tell you. I, yes, I can. You all know. <laughs> <laughs> it is great. But when you start feeling again, it really does, it, it hurts so much. And I just want to encourage you that when you go through this, um, you got, feelings are going to come back to you, and you're going to not know what's happening to you. And I don't know where this tape is going to go. And if this tape is ever put in the hands of someone right now who may be listening um, to it that uh, is not out yet, has not come out as Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to have all kinds of feelings, and it's because God is giving you a heart of flesh again. You know, the stone is just crumbling. I would like to bring up my husband right now. You'd like to just say a couple of things about how you, he had, he was recognizing a lot of this um, um, a misery that I was going through, and he stayed with me. <laughs> yeah, um, my wife, because of all the things that had happened to her, uh, really put all kinds of tests upon me. And it, was, <laughs> it was it was a time where I was just beginning my walk with Jesus. Well, I just discovered him and discovered how powerful he was in my life. I opened the door, and he was there after 43 years of being faithful and being there for me. Okay. When I came here last year, I'd only been here, uh, only been, I feel like, a new person for a couple of months. Uh, since I had met Mary two months before and started going to church after being away for 25 years, I I saw this place as a as a as a place of spiritual growth, where I could if I could I could see that these people had come so far from a cult to a place with Jesus, and I knew that if they could do it, that I could do it. <laughs> I uh, was remembering
remembering the tears were just flowing down my face. And I'm a manager of uh, many people, and I have had jobs with all kinds of responsibility. I've spoke before hundreds of people and never had any kind of, allowed myself any kind of these feelings. And when Stephen Berg spoke last year, I understood that it wasn't just ex-Jehovah Witnesses that had a hard heart. It was lots of us, lots of us who never even maybe spoke to a Jehovah Witness once in a while. But we can all develop hardness of heart and that only Jesus can soften that heart and give us a chance to live and be free. The chains that we put on ourselves are just phenomenal and that we need to break free of them. And it's something that the world puts on us. And we have to allow ourselves a chance to break free of those by putting our focus on Jesus. This he certainly is the answer. And I thought this past week, one of the testaments for me to that is uh, Mary had indicated, you know, not all the pruning is over for you, Mike. I feel the Lord is telling me this scripture, and she read the scripture to our home group and said, not all the pruning is over for you. And, um, uh, you know, I had lost my, my home and my business, my marriage, everything that I had built upon my own strength before I found out about where the strength really comes from, the Lord. I thought that the pruning was over too, but she had indicated that maybe it wasn't. So <laughs> I wanted it to be over. Yeah. And you probably noticed that this probably is one of the most honest people I've ever met in my life. She is totally honest, and I could rely upon her. So I was sort of prepared. And uh, this past week, I lost my job. Um, but the remarkable part about it that is the testament for me is that I had so much peace with it. Because whenever I got scared, even now, when I get scared about providing for my family, I just lean back and Jesus is there holding up. And that peace, no one can understand. It goes beyond our understanding. It is really Jesus. And if we allow him to work in our lives, it's just awesome. And this scripture, I just want to share this with you because it just comes to my heart. Some sat in darkness and in gloom, prisoners in misery, and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God. They had spurned the counsel of the Most High. Their hearts were bowed down with hard labor. They fell down and with no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their bonds asunder. Let them thank the Lord for, he, for his steadfast love, for his wonderful words to humankind. For he shatters the doors of bronze, and he cuts in two the bars of iron. It's an awesome thought for me. The shackles that we put on ourselves and that have been put upon us over the years, uh, that can, they can be broken when we turn to Jesus. Isn't he a great guy? <laughs> I just want to say thank you to my mother who has um, put me on prayer list from here to, uh, I don't know, the other end of the world. And, uh, and she, we still, I have still three brothers, uh, three um, members in the witnesses. My mother still prays for them, and I do, and my sister does. And uh, I, we would like to um, sing a happy song here before we um, leave, and I'd like my mother to come up and, and sing with us. Um, come up, Ma. <laughs> and um, actually, it's Nancy Honeytree that's going to be singing, and uh, they're going to play the tape back there, and I, I just want to up because she's just, uh, my mother's really precious to me. And um, we're a family. And if everybody would stand and join us, you'll catch on to the words real quick. Uh, 
I've just got to get you to sing my favorite sing-along song. It's called Ain't It Grand to Be a Christian, and it goes like this. Well, ain't it grand to be a Christian, ain't it grand? Ain't it grand to be a Christian, ain't it grand? All the baby, 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 ba